Okay, today we will uh, complete the, the Odyssey. Uh, today we'll also do uh, most of what we started yesterday. I think um, the books 18 through, through 22, which I think are so great. Uh, I've come only very recently to this discovery uh, in talking about it, uh, in thinking about it, uh, but the theory that I will present to you is that in books 18 through 22, um, Homer uh, creates a, a masterpiece of uh, psychological and ultimately spiritual, um, I think, profundity. Superficially, here's what happens. Uh, Odysseus is there, He's he has already mingled, we've done book 18, uh, he's already mingled with uh, the suitors, and what we're finding is a steady rise, steady and very controlled rise of psychological and spiritual tension uh, that takes place among the suitors. Superficially, again, uh, what happens is that uh, this strange old beggar who is among them seems to, his presence at least, has a strange, unsettling, um, eerie influence upon the suitors. They don't understand it. He's just an old man. Uh, albeit an extraordinary old man, they don't understand it, they don't understand the how his presence can have such an unsettling and strange effect on them, but it does. But really, his presence, uh, of course, he's Odysseus. And uh, although Homer never points this out, I would say, if uh, we, we, the readers, should try to imagine Odysseus's eyes, his eyes, watchful, like a, like a predator, really, uh, watchful, sharp, looking for signs of weakness, looking for, for signs of, uh, of anything, uh, watching them closely, uh, unsettling, perhaps, but really his eyes are Athena's eyes. He and Athena really are one, uh, as I've tried to show throughout. Uh, but as is clear, I think, from, from book one, really. Uh, so we're reaching the climax here. If we compare books 18 through 22 of the Odyssey with those of the Iliad, my God, we're at the weakest part of the Iliad and we're at the strongest part of the Odyssey. Um, there's only one place where the Iliad is stronger, and that's book... Uh, they are book 20, books 23 and 24. Um, that's my thesis. Okay, so this growing tension uh, that they don't understand that seems to swallow them. I'm going to demonstrate to you that Homer knew what he was doing and that this is exactly what he was doing. Okay, book 19. Um, it's... Let's you know, after 18, it's daytime again. Uh, the suitors appear, they bring some gifts. Uh, Odysseus is up and about. This is the big day. Uh, in 19, the, the feasting and the partying begins right away, as apparently every day. Um, and uh, here, I'm not quite sure... Um, Frankly, in details, I'm kind of weak on uh, on the differences distinguishing between uh, 1920 and 21. Uh, 21 is a little clearer. What happened in 1920 then? Uh, in 19 or in 20, various things happen. Uh, for one thing, uh, they force Odysseus to... Uh, there's another beggar in the palace. He's a big man. Eros, I-R-O-S, uh, and he a little bit challenges Odysseus. He's big, but he's weak. Uh, and the suitors get the cute idea of forcing these two beggars to fight 
for territorial rights, basically. Odysseus doesn't want this. Uh, the beggar, the big beggar, let's call him, Eros, uh, doesn't want it either, but uh, they force it um, with threats. So, um, the, oh, the, the prize will be a, a pudding. Now, pudding was, uh, I better not get into details, a pudding. Okay, so then Odysseus, um, let's say, pulls up his, his tunic, whatever he's wearing on his um, lower half, and they get a look at those legs, and those legs must be huge and powerful. Up, they get a glimpse of his arms, his forearms and his shoulders maybe, tremendous, and they think, oh my god, this is an old beggar? Uh, the beggar Eros sees too and trembles. Uh, they square off, and Odysseus thinks like, just as he always does. Now, shall I kill him? So, Odysseus can could kill him with his fist because he's a very good boxer. Kill? Uh, no, I'll just kind of um, hurt him, and end this thing quickly. So, left hits him on the base of the neck here. Down goes Eros, uh, bleeding through the mouth. Uh, trembling, uh, unconscious. The suitors laugh, and this laughter is important. The suitors laugh, and the pudding goes to Odysseus, and the poor Eros, the beggar, is dragged away. Another thing that happens is that during the partying, uh, another of the suitors becomes very upset at Odysseus, uh, angry, takes an ox's hoof, which I take, take to be an ox's leg, not just the hoof, of course, but that whole part. It's big and heavy, as is implied in the, in the text. Throws it at Odysseus. Well, of course, it's slow moving and there's nothing fast here. So Odysseus easily ducks. It hits the wall behind Odysseus, bounces off the wall and hits a servant going by, carrying uh, cups and bowls and things like that, metal, I think crash bang down it goes uh the suitors laugh and laugh and laugh but this laughter as i'm telling you is key and you'll see why um and the third most important thing that happens is that that fugitive prophet seer uh i thought of his name the other day thrasilochus us. I'm, I, I've lost it. The prophet whom, uh, who became uh, the suppliant to uh, Tiresias back there at Pylos. Thrasymachus? Thrasymachus, maybe. Anyway, um, his host, because uh, Telemachus had given him into the care of a young friend of his because he didn't want to bring him to the home, embarrassing and trouble, Host brings him by, brings him to Telemachus, saying, I'm sorry, I've got to go out of town. Uh, I can't take care of him. I have to return him to you. And so Thrasymachus, I'll call him, uh, is looking around just when the partying and the hilarity, um, wild laughter, some drunkenness, but it's not alcohol. It's not alcohol, uh, are reaching their, their height. Uh, and he looks around, and he sees he has a prophetic vision. And this, in many ways, in some ways, this is even the, the, the peak moment of the Odyssey, in some ways, emotionally. Because he says, I see blood everywhere. I hear sh shouts, uh, screams of men dying. Uh, an atmosphere, uh, uh, maybe even he says, I must check. Uh, some god is uh, active or something. And the suitors just, as Americans say, crack up. Laugh and laugh and laugh. And they're making funny comments, of course, like, uh, oh, who's your strange friend? Tell him, because you bring some strange people here, meaning Odysseus, the, the beggar. Um, 
so strange, and they start laughing, and they can't stop laughing. And there are tears coming down their faces. I must check details here. But this is hysterical laughter. This is not funny laughter. This is uncontrollable, eerie, the goddess at work laughter. This is despairing laughter, really, uh, because their, their doom surrounds them. Um, this is what I mean. Uh, this strange, strange atmosphere which culminates with the vision of Thrasymachus, uh, I'm calling him, yeah. uh, that confirms in my mind exactly what's happening here. And it is strange. It derives from Odysseus. He's the cause of it. But that in turn, Odysseus in turn, in turn derives, so to speak, from Athena. And Athena's will uh, and really this is Athena's moral will. These guys deserve to die. Uh, these guys are, are morally culpable. Uh, their death surrounds them. Uh, my will will make sure that none of them escapes. Uh, and all this works through Odysseus, and especially through his watchful eyes, I think. Now, this is my own imagination. Homer never draws attention to Odysseus's eyes or his watchfulness, even. But imagine him. He's preparing to kill these men. Uh, watching, watching, watching. When will he do it? He doesn't have a he, he sort of has a definite plan, but not exactly. Um, let's see, now, there was one other detail. Ah, yes. Uh, in 19, I would say, um, Odysseus is begging, as always. He must, if everyone had given him a scrap, he would have had a mountain of food. 100, 130 suitors? Okay. And at one point, he talks to Amphinomus. Amphinomus is a good guy, a decent guy. Uh, he has never par uh, taken taken part in the more shameful activities. He's a good guy, and Odysseus knows it. And Odysseus says to him, basically, he says to him, "You shouldn't be here. You should try to get out of here." Uh, it's not that explicit, but he gives him a chance because he likes him, and he sees that he's not really guilty. But Homer says Athena closed Amphinomus's mind so that. There's no way that he could leave. He stays. Uh, this is the will of the goddess. So you can see um, it's this psychological prison camp, psychologically a prison camp, with rising, rising tension. And the tension is this bewilderment and wonderment, and they're caught, psychologically caught there. They can't move. They don't understand what's happening. Somehow, this can't be Odysseus, this old, miserable beggar. Uh, the thought never occurs to them that this is Odysseus. It never occurs to them. Uh, and yet, the confusion, the disorder, the tension, the conflicts, uh, the strange laughter, everything is going crazy. This is the will of the goddess through Odysseus. Does he know it? He's, in a sense, he is an instrument himself of this. Uh, it's powerful. It's so powerful and so sustained over these four, it could begin in 17 even, but really 18. It's so powerful and so sustained through these five books uh, I'm suggesting that this is a masterpiece. This is profound. And ultimately, it's religious. Uh, and ultimately, it begins with Book One. Uh, because this is where the will of the goddess and the will of the hero coalesce, merge, become one. Uh, and their power, their power is so pervasive, so inescapable, inescapable.
Um, this is where the the Odyssey is at least the equal of the Iliad. And for the rest, uh, storytelling and all that, it is also. It's only in 23 and 24 where there is some falling off, uh, and that's where the uh, Iliad uh, becomes, along with Book 9, at its best. Okay, so... Uh, oh, oh boy, another one. 20. Did I tell? No, I already told about that. Let's see now. Okay, I already told about uh, the signs from uh, Zeus, uh, the lightning, the maid saying, uh, Zeus, Father, if only this could be the last day that these suitors uh, are in the world. I already told about that, but amazing. And it all fits together, I think. Okay, uh, finally 21. Uh, remember Fe Feast of Apollo. Feast of Apollo, I think, I hope I've mentioned that uh, Apollo's in on this too, uh, inobtrusively. Okay, so uh, uh, Penelope and Telemachus fetch the ac the axes and the bow and the arrows. Bring them up. I imagine the men gathered in what is like a horseshoe, a big horseshoe. That is, the group begins here, the bow will go around this way, all the way around. At the beginning, Telemachus is going to be first. And then others, including Amphinomus, recently mentioned, will be among, among the first. Last were to be Eurymachus and Antinous, the um, suitors. Okay, excuse me. Um, so, Telemachus tries first. Three times he tries, he can't do it. The fourth time, Homer says, alas, it's kind of weak, he could have done it. He could have strung the bow. But he glanced over at Odysseus, and Odysseus shook his head, and he relented. Okay, this is a little bit embarrassing, because this supposes that young Telemachus, 18, 19, 20, is the strongest of all these guys. I don't believe it, uh, and no reader could believe it. Um, uh, maybe he's a strong boy, but he's not the strongest of these men. But, okay. So then, around it goes, and all of these men complain, Oh my God, we're nothing compared with this Odysseus. We can't even string the man's bow. I estimate that at least a third, a third to a half of the... Um, suitors try and get nowhere. Meanwhile, the sun is going down. Uh, no, it's not. No, it's not nighttime, but it's afternoon. And Eurymachus says, uh, this is dreary, this is depressing. Let's stop for today. The festival will continue tomorrow. Tom we'll party the rest of this day, and tomorrow uh, someone will string the bow uh, and marry Penelope, and uh, this game will be over. So they put they start to put it away, and Odysseus, as planned, calls out. He says, uh, Telemachus, can I have a try? Uh, I'd like to have a try at that bow. I know I'm an old old beggar, but uh, I was once pretty strong. And Telemachus orders Eumaeus, who is there, the swineherd, to take the bow to the old beggar. Howls, howls of uh, protest, of uh, laughter, of joking, uh, confusion and poor Eumaeus cowers in fear and Telemachus becomes uh, powerful Eumaeus take it to him now um, and the will of Telemachus prevails, is stronger Eumaeus takes the bow to Odysseus the arrows somehow mysteriously have arrived at Odysseus too uh, and he starts testing the bow for worm holes, for decay, for uh, damage over time, and all that. Examines it closely. Uh, he's an expert. He's an expert. And then he scatters the arrows uh, in front of him, and then he calmly strings the bow. 
in a seated position, I think uh, his strength just so great. Um, calmly strings the bow. Uh, and he shouts to Telemachus, Telemachus, I still have some of my strength. Roars of confusion, of laughter. After all, one of the jokes was, why shouldn't he have a try? Do you think Penelope is going to marry him? <laughs> Witty. Uh, uh, but they don't know. And book 21 ends. As I told you, I think before 21, the ending of 21 is not unlike the ending of book 8 where Antinous had asked, who are you anyway? The stage is set. Um, dramatic moment. Book 22, the climax. Here we go. Uh, really, it's told quite easily. Uh, what has to happen during this book is that all the, slaughter, uh, all the uh, suitors will be slaughtered dead. Uh, I like to think of it as a kind of anticlimax. It's an anti... Uh, uh, that is... The idea here is that the serious dramatic tension has already passed. Uh, what follows now is a formality. And this formality will be conducted in a methodical dream sequence. It's the, in fact, I like to think of it as it's the dream sequence of success uh, at whatever. When the success is a foregone conclusion, uh, the preparations have been so complete uh, the will of the goddess here is so is so inescapable, so pervasive, so palpable. Uh, in this case, it follows as a dream, and you'll see it's like a dream. It's a geometrical dream. Uh, beginning of 22, here we go. Uh, confusion, roars, and so forth. Uh, and just at that moment, and, and, uh, Antinous who is the most dangerous of the suitors, the one who is or could be a real threat. Not that he can match Odysseus in strength, but he's a violent guy uh, and cunning too. Uh, takes up a, a, a glass of wine and he's about like this. He's drinking. Boom! First arrow, right through his throat. Dead. No more antinous. Right there. Wow. Uh, and this is a wonderful moment. Um, this one. This is the best moment of book uh, 22, I think. Because uh, the suitors say, Hey, be careful there. <laughs> they treat her, It must be an accident. It must have been an accident. <laughs> hey, you should be careful. Bows and arrows are dangerous things. <laughs> wonderful. Uh, and Odysseus says, You dogs. You wanted to sleep with my wife, you eat my food, you drink my wine, you, he doesn't say this, but uh, you tried to kill my son, you're dead. I'm, go I'm Odysseus, back from uh, long 20 years away, I'm going to kill you all. And they scatter and try to hide. Now I imagine that he has about 50 arrows. Remember, I told you before that uh, Telemachus and Eumaeus had already put away the armor into some back room. I didn't tell you when, but I told you about the plan. So, there are no weapons available. Uh, Antinous is dead. They're hiding, looking around, running around, and all that. Now, become, now begins the dream sequence, because one by one, he shoots, he hits, one is dead. Every arrow, deadly. Every arrow, well, of course, that's absurd. I mean, somebody's going to hit in the hand, somebody's going to hit in the shoulder or something. Everyone dead. So this is totally unreal, or if you like, surreal. Like a dream. It's a dream sequence. Uh, imagine 50 arrows. Why not? 50 dead men. This is totally unreal. Um... This is a psychological moment. In fact, it invites a psychological and allegorical interpretation of the whole work. Maybe, maybe. Um, I don't think it is, though. Um, but this certainly is. As such, um, it's no match for book 22 of the uh, Iliad either. 22 is not the best book. That's where Achilles kills uh, Hector. And that kind of unfolds as a dream, too. 
Remember, Hector runs three times around the city. Believable? No. Uh, then the strange Deiphobus scene, where he thinks his brother is helping him. Very strange. Uh, what emerges from this is, I think, a kind of... At moments of success, when things reach a kind of completion in our lives, these are less real than the other moments of our lives. Uh, we are more the instrument of something bigger than us, maybe, maybe. I'm, I don't literally believe this, but I do literally believe the dream sequence um, is unreal. It can't be believed in. Uh, its reality is very questionable. Uh, okay, 50 dead. Then, uh, I forgot to tell you, in book uh, 20, Odysseus had had his reunion with Eumaeus and a cowherd, Philoetius. Maybe I did mention him. Anyway, he took them outside and he said to them, You guys, what would you do if Odysseus returned? Would you side with the suitors or would you side with him? Both of them unhesitatingly say, I would side with Odysseus under any conditions or circumstances. I'm he. Uh, they doubt at first. Uh, he shows them the scar. It's a quick scene. But they're convinced, and howls of tears um, of emotion, as in most of the um, reunions. In, uh, in fact, uh, maybe the least emotional one is the one with Penelope coming up in book 23, which is great. Okay. So then they form a plan. One of them is to guard the gate. The other of them is to, uh, at a certain moment, bring armor to... Uh, uh, you, this is where Eumaeus has to bring the arrow, to the bow to Odysseus. And also later when the fighting begins, bring armor for the four of them so that they have armor because, of course, the arrows will run out. What then? Then they have to uh, kill these guys with spears and so forth. So, uh, and that's Eumaeus. So, the fighting, uh, the, uh, during the arrow sequence, Telemachus and Eumaeus go to the special room and bring armor for the four of them. Uh, now, when, after the arrows uh, run out, then all four of them would throw spears simultaneously. And every time, four dead men. Come on. Come on. Uh, this is totally a psychological dream. Uh, then, at a certain point, the, some of the suitors have armor. More and more of the suitors have armor. Odysseus says, Telemachus, uh, go and check the armor room. I think someone is su supplying these guys with armor. He goes back there. It's true, Dad. Someone has. We'll go back there and catch that person and make sure he doesn't provide any more armor. So Telemachus and Eumaeus go back there, hide behind the door, and in comes that Melanthius, that insolent uh, goat herd who had kicked Odysseus in Book 17 on the way to town. Uh, he comes in expect, uh, suspecting nothing. They jump him, they tie him up, and they put him, leave him hanging from the rafter up above there, very uncomfortably, uh, arms and legs tied behind him. He's not dying, but he's very uncomfortable. Then they return, uh, locking the door, I guess, or something. Uh, and the killing continues. Four the the uh, suitors throw four also, but they always miss. Uh, one of them wounds Telemachus on the wrist. One of them maybe wounds Eumaeus on the wrist. Four dead? Nothing. Four dead? Nothing. Four dead? Nothing. Well, this is going to take a while because there are 130 of them. Eighty, if I'm right. That's perfect, actually. The four works well. Twenty-four dead? 20, nothing. 24 dead, nothing. 
Well, it's totally unbelievable, it's totally uh, fantastical, but in the end, lots of dead bodies. Uh, Odysseus spares uh, a couple of people, but they're not suitors, and they didn't deserve to die anyway. At the end of Book 22, uh, after this kind of dream song sequence nonsense, some interesting moments. The place is very messy, of course, blood, mess. Uh, Odysseus uh, says, um, someone go and wake up uh, Eurycleia, the great maid, and then force the unfaithful uh, maids to clean up this meth mess, and then Telemachus, you go out and uh, cut their throats, kill them. Interesting. So, uh, first we get the uh, maids. Hmm. That's at the beginning of 23. No. No. That's right. Uh, so, we don't even use Eurycleia to identify the unfaithful maids. Telemachus knows too, of course. So the unfaithful maids are picked out. They clean up the mess. Uh, Telemachus and the, the other two guys drag the dead bodies into the neighboring courtyard um, where they have to be burned or taken care of. Uh, the mess is cleaned up. And then Telemachus, one interesting little detail, Odysseus had told him to go out to take the unfaithful maids out. How many? Twelve? Twenty? I don't know. And slice their throats. But he has a different idea. He arranges a rope, like a clothesline, I take it to be, from one end of the other, to the other or something. He hangs them. Because uh, this is very interesting. Why would he do that? Anger, maybe. Uh, because hanging is slower? As a slower death? I think maybe. He hangs them. And Homer says, they kicked the bodies uh, hanging from the ropes. They kicked, but not for long. Great line. Uh, Homer with his clear sight of things, his Homer's eyes are kind of like Odysseus's, watching, and kind of like Athena's. He watches, and he notes. He watches, and he notes. No comment. Watches and notes. Powerful. Uh, and at the end of Book 22, we get a wonderful moment, uh, neglected, I think, uh, by some, and that's the reunion with the faithful maids. Very emotional. as they gather <clears throat> around Odysseus, very emotional, and he is emotional too. Uh, such moments say a lot about Odysseus. Um, the, f <clears throat> the feelings that uh, those people, nameless, they're anonymous, no one knows them, not one of them has been individualized. Uh, the feelings that they have and express for Odysseus Tremendous, tremendous, and must be taken seriously. And again, they are common people. These are slaves. Book 23 and 4. Here we go. Uh, at the beginning of Book 23, uh, someone, I guess Telemachus, wakes up. Uh, oh, no. Uh, come. She's not sleeping. Uh, ah, okay. No, she was up before. Uh, she was. Uh, she did help in the identification of the unfaithful maids. Eurycleia. When she comes downstairs, uh, oh, some, she had been told to lock the door and keep the maids upstairs during the action, no matter what they heard. That's right. Uh, that was the instruction to her in Book 18. Uh, now she, the door is unlocked. She comes out. She sees the, bloody, uh, the blood and the dead bodies, and she shouts in triumph. And Odysseus says, no, no, that's not, that's not, proper, that's uh, sac a sacrilege almost, um, and maybe Odysseus, after the kill, is feeling quietly, what, um, this is his moment of triumph, the whole thing has happened as a dream, maybe it still feels like a dream to him, 
but he knows I think we could say because this ends my thesis here because here is the, here it is the end of book 22 the end of the most powerful most profound uh, block of material in the book uh, he should feel and he does feel I think that he too has been an instrument of a bigger will than his this was not his will it couldn't have happened without a bigger will uh, how did it happen I don't even know I I shot some arrows I threw some spears they're all dead uh, but a bigger will than his has been at work here uh, if I'm right and this is speculation but it's not speculation this is what has happened but what is speculation is whether how much of this he understands uh, he has I think maybe a mystic sense that what has happened has been God's will not his uh, he has been an instrument uh, and he's aware of this and he accepts that of course completely and rejoice in the success success failure is God's will uh, and I think he has a somewhat humble um, sense of this I think that's what's happening book 23 Eurycleia is sent to wake up Penelope she wakes up Eurycleia tells her your husband's home the suitors are dead that old beggar was your husband and is by the way we're never told when exactly um, Athena retransforms him back to his normal look uh, it must happen slowly gradually don't know at first Penelope doesn't believe and it's a parallel to Calypso beginning of book 5 when uh, or early in book 5 when Calypso tells him you're free to go doesn't believe Penelope doesn't believe it's a somewhat powerful uh, parallel suggesting the similarity of temperament of mentality of the husband and wife this greatest <clears throat> that's certainly true this greatest of husbands and wives of uh, of antiquity of myth but I would make a little cynical observation uh, this great marriage of theirs has has thriven has thrived in absence <laughs> their marriage is great but because because partly I'm sorry there it is because they have not lived together <laughs> they've been apart for 20 years they've been married for 23 years they've been apart for 20 years great marriage Woo! sorry but that's the way it looks uh, okay so she comes down she's cautious uh, the mess she sees Odysseus uh, and she just watches I won't comment on this anymore because you see Odysseus's the similarity she watches she looks at him she re she can't quite believe she watches uh, silent um, and Odysseus sits there he still looks pretty bad um, but he's going to bathe pretty soon I forget what, exactly when he bathes and cleans up but it doesn't matter and Telemachus you, loses patience mother mother this is your husband uh, who's been gone for 20 years um, welcome him uh, greet him something and <clears throat> Odysseus says Telemachus calm uh, take your time um, husbands and wives have ways secret ways of recognizing and knowing each other that other people don't know about uh, give it time um, very sharp okay so sitting there sitting there sitting there really maybe 23 okay I take it back because of this because of this 23 equals uh, 23 in the Iliad um, but it's just one incident uh, but it's great okay here we go okay um, and it's now it's getting toward nightfall uh, Odysseus has already said by the way oh no no he hasn't no. It's getting toward nightfall, and Penelope says, uh, "You must be tired, uh, and I'll have the servants uh, bring down your bed for you to sleep in." 
Oh boy. It's a great moment. Okay. So, and... Okay. He... Um, what does he do? He bursts out in... It's, it's quite emotional. Uh, he's emotional. And he says, What? How can you bring my bed down? I made our bed out of the trunk of a tree. The point here is this, that a tree must be quite large. Olive, of course, Athena. Still, its roots in the ground extends up to the second story, the second floor, and became the foundation of their marriage bed, their connubial bed. The bed is built on it. Well, this is perfect. I mean, crudely, symbolically, this makes the foundation of their marriage Athena. Olive, Athena. Well, this is just almost overkill, almost too much uh, in support of, uh, of course, what I'm saying. Okay, no one could move that unless you could um, uproot the tree or cut off the tree. Trick. <laughs> She tricked him to to recognize him. <laughs> okay, and she won. She won. She tricked him. <laughs> I had forgotten. I guess I had forgotten how emotional it is. But anyway, enough, enough, enough. <laughs> They are together. They sp <clears throat> they spend the night together. Uh, Athena <laughs> Athena triples the length of the night. <laughs> Stupid, to allow them time together. Uh, and they they uh, make love, as she says, as Homer says. Uh, and then they talk and talk and talk and tell stories all night. Okay, in the morning, still book twenty three. In the morning, he says, Look, dear, we've got problems. These suitors all had fathers and brothers. These people are going to be looking for their loved ones, find out they're dead, and they're going to be coming after us, coming after me. So here's what we're doing. I'm going to arrange for musicians to play all day so that people think a wedding is going on. Maybe your wedding. Ironic. Nice. Uh, nice touch. Doesn't bother him at all. Meanwhile, Telemachus and the guys and I will go out to find my father out in the woods uh, because dad lives out in the woods uh, in his... Uh, he just prefers to live out there to in order to get the violence when it happens not here in the palace to make the violence happen out there. Clever. Always thinking. End of book 23, 24. Here we go. Finale. Uh, they go to the woods, and uh, Odysseus says, Telemachus, you and Eumaeus and Philoetius, you go to Dolios's house. I think I told you long ago, Dolios is the father of Melanthius. Oh, I forgot to tell you that. Uh, at the end of book 22, Melanthius, remember, was hanging up on a rafter out there. Uh, well, they brought him down, cut off everything that could be cut off. Again, everything that could be cut off, they cut off. And he died a pretty terrible death. But um, kind of a bad guy. Um, kicked Odysseus, uh, indecent, uh, bad mouth, helped the suitors. Uh, of course, his sister, Melantho, who was... I never mentioned that, but Odysseus had scolded her. She was sleeping with Eurymachus, unfaithful. She died among the unfaithful maids. Both of them are children of this Dolios, but Dolios also has seven other sons who are with him. Very interesting. Nine children, two of them dead. Does he know his two children are dead? Does he know how they died? Uh, we don't know. Uh, but he's very faithful to Odysseus, so one supposes that even if he did know that he would have accepted their deaths because he would have recognized what kind of people they were, totally disloyal to Odysseus. 
but we don't know, and it's kind of interesting. Okay, you guys go there, prepare dinner. I'm going to find Dad. Dad is out there in the orchard, tending trees in the orchard where he spends a lot of time. So they go that way, Odysseus goes and finds Dad. There's Dad working among the trees, um, fruit trees. He's dressed horribly, uh, kind of like Odysseus has been in his disguise. Uh, neglected terribly. In fact, he sleeps maybe at Dolios' house on the floor somewhere. Uh, he is a man in terrible uh, condition. Why? His son gone, wife dead. Remember Anticlea in Book 11. Okay, so Odysseus sees him from a distance, is moved, but decides to be tough. And this is a lot of Odysseus. Not the toughness, but the testing. Because he's going to test him. Just like he tests people. Uh, it's a little bit annoying, but it's the man. Um, and he always thinking, always analyzing and thinking. And trying to think of what's best too. Uh, and I think maybe he thinks, Dad, Dad, it's me, I'm your son, I'm home. Uh, I've killed the suitors. He thinks maybe this might kill the man. Uh, it w might be so overwhelming. So he goes to him and tests him. And he says, old man, what are you doing out here working in the, among the trees like this? You should be sitting by a fire or something. And uh, I, who, what are you doing? I'm, my son is gone. Uh, maybe he's dead. I'm just kind of, I'm waiting to die. Uh, I know your son. I knew your son, Odysseus, and I think he's going to be home uh, pretty soon. One of these lying stories, these so many lying stories. One has to remember, uh, I briefly in Book 11, the second of the th three huge figures, Sisyphus, rolling the, hill, the stone up the hill, down it comes. Sisyphus was the master liar, and he lied and tried to trick the gods. That's why he was there. Odysseus, master liar. Uh, and that's why, according to one tradition, Sisyphus must have been the father of Odysseus. Not this Laertes, nice man, but totally different from Odysseus. Okay. And then suddenly, suddenly, we don't know why, uh, uh, he, Odysseus stops the lines and he says, Dad, it's me. Wait a minute, was this the plan? No, this was not the plan. Uh, we don't know what his plan was, but to do it like this? No. I think <clears throat> the emotion gripped Odysseus, and he couldn't, <sighs> he couldn't maintain this pretense. He couldn't keep it up. Well, really, what happens is the old man faints, almost dies. Odysseus, Odysseus, did you stop thinking? Yeah, I think he did stop thinking. Um, is it the only time when he stops thinking? Maybe. Except for the very emotional uh, reunions. Uh, his thought... So, I'm going to look at this symbolically for a moment. If the Odyssey is about the reintegration of this man's personality, uh, seen as the reconciliation between him and the goddess, and all that is truly he... Uh, his son, uh, his land, uh, his wife, his servants, and finally his father. If this is what it's about, he having already had his reunion with his mother in Book 11, uh, then this is pretty important. Father, pretty important. Anyway, he's okay. Dad, come. We're going to go uh, eat dinner at uh, Dolius's. People are preparing this, and I think the suitors will be coming for us. Now, this revives Father quite a lot. He was a warrior in his time, uh, no, not very famous, at least not in myth. They go to Dolios' house, and we have the final uh, reunion between Odysseus and o Dolios and Dolios' seven sons, all of whom are loyal. So we have Dolios and seven sons, that makes eight, plus four, Telemachus, Eumaeus, Philoetius, and Odysseus, 12. 
perfect geometrical number, just like the 4444, four, 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 uh, the 12 everywhere, uh, 12 ships, uh, 12 men to, this is Homer, the geometrical um, age poet. Okay, they start to feast and Telemachus looks out the window, uh-oh, here they come, put on our armor, and they go out. These 12 against a 100? Don't know how many. Uh, being led by Antinous's father. Now, it turns out that of all people, Antinous and his father, even less, uh, should be disloyal to Odysseus because Odysseus had saved the father's life. One time when his father was a fugitive being pursued by people, Odysseus had uh, defended him and uh, saved his life. Uh, and yet, he is leading the pack of people, uh, his, his son died, okay, but uh, that Antinous should have been uh, so disloyal to him uh, I must kind of, must have stung Odysseus a little bit. Anyway, here we go, the final scene. Uh, now they are ranged one against the other, uh, and... Um, of all things, Athena breathes power into Laertes. Oh, Odysseus, Telemachus. Telemachus, be strong now, be brave. Don't worry about me, Dad. Uh, almost a vying, a vying uh, father's son. This makes grandfather, Laertes, very happy. And Athena breathes strength into him. Uh, it's Athena's will all the way to the end. It just strikes me now. And Laertes throws the spear through the air, hits Antinous' father, the leader. Down he goes. Now the fighting is about, in serious is about to begin. Just as Antinous's death had been the first, remember the arrow? Antinous' father now, the parallel is striking here. Always Athena working her will. And just then, a voice, voice of Zeus, no fighting, end of fighting, uh, put down your weapons, this is going to end peacefully. Uh, and Odysseus, this is interesting, gives his war cry and is about to charge and start killing. Lightning from the sky at the feet of Athena, who is right there. Athena, Athena and Zeus. Because ultimately, Athena's, ultimately Athena's will is Zeus's will. Wherever we see Athena, we see Zeus, basically, too. They are one. Their will is one. Um, lightning, as if to say, don't do it, Odysseus, obey. Odysseus stops. The end. The end of the Odyssey. So you can see that it's been the will of Athena, and behind it, Zeus, yes, throughout. From the very beginning, actually, technically, we began with Zeus speaking. Uh, Zeus turning authority, giving total authority to Athena in this matter. That's what the, the Odyssey is, from beginning to end. Um, that's the end. The lightning, no more. Okay, we did it. Uh, an amazing thing. Now, is 24 strong? It's not, it's no match at all, of course, for 24 of the Odyssey. There, nothing, nothing much can match that. Uh, Lear and um, Antony and Cleopatra, I would say, um, in Act 4 and 5. Um, both of them, in fact, Act 4 and 5, that's interesting, um, are the peaks along with Book 24 of the Iliad. But the work as a whole, uh, as a work of serious religious intensity, so different from the mockery or silliness of the Iliad, you see my point, uh, assuming one author of both, this assumes a huge evolution on the part of the poet, from the po religiously, religiously thinking, uh, from the poet of the Iliad to the po poet of the Odyssey. Huge evolution but serious and profound at its best. I remind you that there are still many silly moments. Uh, the, there are the silly, same 
Iliadic silly gods too in the Odyssey, but not when it's serious. And its seriousness uh, is most profound, books 18 through 22. Thank you.